Paldea, home to 400 Pokemon and our first completely open world region. Now, since the games have come out, I've been playing them pretty much nonstop, and there's a few things that I kind of wish I knew before I started. Pokemon has become a way too handholdy over the last couple generations, but there's still a lot of things that the games just straight up don't tell you. With Scarlet and Violet being the biggest games in the series so far, I'm here to tell you everything you need to know before starting your adventure in Paldea. Beating Titan Pokemon improves your traversal capabilities. That is a mouthful. One of the major selling points of these games is that you can go anywhere and do anything. Now, that's not wrong, but I'm here to give you a suggestion. I would strongly recommend prioritizing beating Titan Pokemon, specifically the first three. Reason is, every time you beat a Titan Pokemon, your ride Pokemon gain a new ability. The Path of Legends is definitely the most challenging storyline to start with, but doing so will make exploring much more fun and way less tedious. When it comes to Pokemon, in the past it always felt like your traversal upgrades were given to you at like kind of arbitrary points in the game. In Kanto, you don't get the bike until a third of the way in. In the remakes, you don't get the running shoes until after you beat Brock. I love that Scarlet and Violet give you the ability to run right away. And you get your ride Pokemon early on too. But the truth is, it just feels like a glorified bike until you get that third upgrade. Before then, yeah, you can get around faster, but you can't really go to new areas. After this, you don't need to rush to finish the storyline, as the 4th and 5th Titans grant traversal that makes your life easier, yes, but doesn't broaden the scope that much at the end of the day. Don't be a schmuck like me. Get those Titans out of the way early. Exploration is key. When you first pick up the game, you might say to yourself, well, I can always come back for exploration, or maybe I'll just explore a little bit as I walk to my next destination. Maybe you're like super motivated to get through the story. Now, don't get me wrong, you can play the games this way, but if you don't stop and search for what's out there, you're gonna be missing out on a lot. Believe me when I say there are secrets everywhere. Every step you take in the wild could have three or four hidden treasures nearby. You can stray from your path to explore something only to get carried away on a chain of self-imposed side quests. By the time you come back to the original path, you might have spent hours. I think what makes Scarlet and Violet special compared to past Pokemon games is there's just so much more to explore in the first place and the rewards you get are almost always worth it. The developers have hidden so much off the beaten path, including many of the region's coolest Pokemon. It is an incredible feeling to, on a hunch, set off on your own little search and be rewarded with something that you know most players will have missed. And the entire game is like this. It's honestly incredible. It's not like this is a burden either. Exploring always leads to a rare item or a cool new Pokemon, making you want to do it over and over again. Because of this, Scarlet and Violet have the most content in any Pokemon game thus far. If you've been thinking to yourself, hey, they're kind of starting to skimp on the content, you're in for a real treat. Now, normally at this point in the video, I pause and tell you how few of my viewers are actually subscribed and ask you nicely if you would consider subscribing. Today, though, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to beg. Please, 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 please subscribe. Please, 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 please. Back to the video. No level scaling. Scarlet and Violet might have three stories that you can play in any order, but once you see the levels on some of these bosses, you realize there's most definitely a set order that the game wants you to follow. At one point, I went to fight a boss who ended up being 15 levels higher than me. Not on purpose. That means that the game either expected me to grind super hard or go in a different order. And with all of the quality of life improvements added this gen, I don't think the game wants you to grind. Of course, if you want to fight these super hard bosses first, by all means, grind away. But then you'll be over leveled for the other two stories. Don't get me wrong. I like that you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. But without level scaling, this is kind of more true in theory than in practice. On the other hand, one of the benefits of this is that the game is actually hard. Like, maybe even too hard at times. My advice is, when you run into a boss battle that feels maybe a little bit too difficult, take a break and come back to it later. Farm materials with auto battles. The let's go mechanic is a new feature that, what is it? The let's go mechanic is a new system that allows you to send your Pokemon out to fight without initiating a turn-based battle. Auto battling might seem like a strange feature in a game kind of centered around battling, but it's actually pretty common in JRPGs in general. A lot of people were worried about overleveling, messing up your EVs, or just getting bored. Don't worry, 
This is just another quality of life upgrade that alleviates grinding. And there's a huge incentive to use it. You can farm materials to craft items and TMs. Because TMs are one-time use again, auto battles are about to become your best friend. This is kind of the same thing we were doing in Legends Arceus, except instead of crafting items, we're kind of crafting moves. I don't know about y'all, but I felt like I was always burning through materials super fast in that game, so I was always farming to get more. In Scarlet and Violet, you're pretty much doing the same thing, except against wild Pokemon rather than the environment. Don't skimp out on this, I promise you it's worth it. It is worth noting that auto battles are not the only way to get these materials. You can get them by doing regular battles as well. Auto battles are way faster though, so if you're specifically looking for materials, that's the way to go. Team Star boss battles are actually challenging? Team Star has five bosses, and each of them uses the same final Pokemon. Here's something I wish I knew before I started playing. You cannot affect this Pokemon with status moves or damage over time moves, which maybe doesn't sound like that big a deal to you, but to me, who is always trying to cheese things, this made these fights significantly harder. I'm pretty sure that you can't lower its stats either, but I'm not positive. I tried lowering its speed, but it still always went first, so I don't think that it worked. Unless its speed is just like ridiculous. I don't know. So yeah, you're pretty much going to have to brute force this one. I recommend matching or surpassing it with your levels and really being mindful of your types. If you can boost your own stats, go for it. I know that a lot of people are kind of in the four attacking moves camp, but uh, if this thing keeps running you over, maybe consider it. The Team Star boss battles are surprisingly challenging, so don't feel bad if you're having trouble. I was really worried the first time I entered a Team Star base because the auto battle boss rush mode is really, really, really mind-numbingly easy, but the boss battle at the end definitely makes up for it. Returning from Sword and Shield is the ability to fly to any Pokemon Center you've already been to without needing a Pokemon that actually learns fly. The difference is, this time you can do it from the very beginning of the game. Not having to wait to unlock fast travel makes the game so much more enjoyable, especially as you'll probably be straying far from the path from the very beginning. One thing I didn't know is that you can fly to any lighthouse that you visited, so I definitely recommend you check them out, and not only for the fast travel. Some people scoff at the idea of fast travel in open world games. The argument is normally something like, well, the environment should be interesting enough that you don't want to skip it in the first place. I am not trying to run back and forth to Pokemon Senders every time my Pokemon faints. Also, the game is so big that running from one end of the map to the other takes literally 30 minutes in real life. No thank you, I would rather fly. Pick up every single item. Here's a tip for players thinking about raising strong Pokemon. There are battle items everywhere. Normally, it feels like the items you get for exploring in Pokemon are like Ultra Ball, Super Potion, yay. In Scarlet and Violet, you can find great endgame items early on, as well as a bunch of useful TMs. Besides, you can still buy most items you need. Something I think is cool is you can buy the power items used for Eevee training from the very first store that you visit. Not all these good items are hidden, by the way. Some are just lying around in the open. There are still a bunch of potions and pokeballs as usual, but there's a lot of good stuff too. Way more than normal. Which starter should you choose? Of course, you're probably going to choose whichever one is cutest or whichever one you think is the coolest. But here's another thing to consider. Which starter is going to make your playthrough easy and which one might add a little bit of extra challenge? Unfortunately, because Pokemon doesn't have a manual difficulty option, many players feel the need to make the games harder by adding self-imposed rules, such as with Nuzlocke's. In this game, of course, you can also fight the bosses out of order, but choosing your starter Pokemon is another thing that can add difficulty. Charmander in Generation 1, for example, is known as being the game's hard mode because it makes the first two gyms so much more difficult. My recommendation depends on what you plan to do in these games. In terms of competitive viability, at a glance, it seems like all three starters have potential, at least to me. If I had to rank them, I would say Sprigatito, then Quaxley, then Fuecoco. To be honest, this is the closest in viability I think the starters have ever looked, at least from my lens. I honestly wouldn't be shocked to be completely off base here, but those are my instincts. If you want to get through the game as fast as possible, go with Sprigatito. Speed is really useful in a playthrough, and Sprigatito is by far the fastest of the three starters. Also, its signature move in its final form does more damage than the other two's signature moves. If you're just looking for whichever one is cutest or coolest, that's up to you. For me personally, I'm taking Fuecoco because I like it the best. Utilize your menu. The menus in Pokemon games have always been your tool for checking your party, using items, and seeing your next destination. As time went on, more stuff has been added to streamline your experience. 
Generation 8 allowed us to switch Pokemon out with our PC on the go. We could trade or battle friends from anywhere on the map. Scarlet and Violet take the best parts of what Legends Arceus and Sword and Shield added to the franchise. In other words, you're able to flexibly change your party on the go without needing a Pokemon Center, and you can teach them whatever moves you want at any time. There's also another addition, which, although not the biggest deal in the world, is still really nice to have, which is that you can now reteach a Pokemon move from this menu that they learned via TM and then forgot. In the past, it was only level up moves and maybe egg moves that could be relearned in this way. Look for marks. Marks are one of my favorite features introduced in Sword and Shield, and the vast majority of the player base doesn't even know about them. They're basically a title your Pokemon can have that's visible when you send it out. Sort of like the ones you get after earning a ribbon. The difference is that the only way to get a Pokemon with a mark is to go out and catch it, making them more like shiny Pokemon. Unlike shiny Pokemon, you can't tell if a Pokemon is marked until after you catch it. You might have marked Pokemon already, and you didn't even realize it. There's a ton of marks, but they're all only obtainable through random encounters. In my opinion, they really make each Pokemon feel unique. I'll be hunting for marked versions of all my new favorites. I hope these tips come in handy during your playthroughs, or maybe even help you decide if you want to buy these games. Thank you for watching.